that, that introduction, and I'm honored to be with you this evening. I'm reminded of a phrase from Henry V. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters. And in some sense, even though the struggle we confront we know is daunting, it's the most thrilling and rewarding experience of our lives to fight against injustice and for a higher cause. I want to explain what uh, I've been doing in the last three months. It's, it's, uh, it's a grim tale. Uh, it's really an attempt to provide the most thorough chronicle of the oppression and persecution of Tamils in Sri Lanka since the birth of the country in 1948. It's important even though the particular genocide charges against Sarath Fonseca and Gadabaya Rajapaksi don't begin until they assume their current offices in 2005. But history is important, not only because it's required to memorialize those who are slaughtered and killed in the cause, but also because it casts light on the current motivation of the incumbent uh, officials, which is an element of proving genocide, namely the motivation is to destroy a people in whole or in part because of their ethnicity or religion not for other reasons, at least if you're proving genocide. Uh, over the last three months, with some assistance, I prepared a 1,000-page model genocide indictment. This is it. 1,000 pages, styled United States of America versus Garabaya Rajapaksa and Sarath Fonseca. The charges, 10 counts of genocide, 118 counts of torture and war crimes think this is the best documentation that's available, especially because some of it is hidden since there's blackout in the Tamil areas, no NGOs, no media, the, even the International Committee of the Red Cross has been evicted. All these are signs of guilt. It's what people do, they try to hide their evil in darkness. I want to explain what our theory is, why we've chosen the United States as the forum and try to elicit your support here in this common enterprise. One of the things we did at the outset is to try to identify a manageable target for our energies, a manageable goal that would try to unify all the Tamils in the diaspora, uh, which unfortunately over decades has been uh, earmarked more by fractious divisions than by unified uh, force and command in getting the relief from the atrocities that have been ongoing. So we said a genocide indictment in the United States. And moreover, we selected out as the defendants two individuals who had more than just genocide violations. They also were on the case of Gadabaya, a U.S. citizen, and in the case of Sarah Fonseca, a green card holder. So that gives a political reason for the prosecution. No country is going to be the genocide policeman of the planet and you have to give those in official authority a line to draw that would say, we can prosecute these two, it doesn't get us involved in prosecuting genocide in the Congo or in Tibet or in the Uyghur area of East Turkestan and China. Uh, moreover, we chose the genocide prosecution in the United States because we feel that has the most open court and political system where the influence of public opinion is great. We do have contacts in the Congress and the executive branch, and it doesn't require the maneuvering, the great power politics that happens when you're going into the international arena, the United Nations, the International Criminal Court. China is a big obstacle in any event because they have unilateral veto power in most of these institutions. And lastly, we wanted to choose uh, genocide prosecution as the sole mission of this enterprise at present, Tamils Against Genocide because that is what we felt would unify Tamils more than any other issue. Who can be against prosecuting these wretches? And wretches is probably a euphemism of what they deserve if you look at the mutilations they undertake of even the dead Tamils, molest women's bodies, chop off breasts, chop off heads. And unity is, is important in progress here. We felt that once we could get the genocide prosecutions underway, we could complement them with what I call parallel civil lawsuits under the Torture Victims Protection Act in the United States, 
anyone who is a victim of an extrajudicial killing or torture, no matter where it occurs in the world, no matter the nationality of the victim or the nationality of the culprit, you can sue in the United States to recover damages. And the United States is a very, very strong judicial forum. Those like Ferdinand Marcos, Radovan Karadzic, uh, the mullahs in Iran, Saddam Hussein have all been sued under this statute. So we wanted to use the criminal case as also sort of a, a launching pad that could inspire support for the civil cases that we would control and could move at a faster pace than the criminal proceeding. But I go back to the point, we think that once you expand the mission of an enterprise, given the dynamics of the Tamil diaspora beyond these things that it's hard to imagine anyone disputing at, you risk internecine warfare and arguing whether what the nature of a Tamil state should be, how much energy should go into delisting the Tamil tigers, which creates problems in getting those who are unschooled in the background focused on the genocide because after 9-11, every time you raise the word terrorist organization, people's judgments get quite distorted, get frightened, they don't think anymore. All right, so let me go through, if I can, and explain what genocide is under United States law. Because remember, we're applying United States statutes here. It's not international law, it's not whatever you and I think are genocide. The law of the genocide in the United States, it's section 1091 of the United States Code, defines it as an attempt to destroy a people in whole or in substantial part because of race, religion, nationality, or ethnicity. Not because of politics, not because you're involved in hostility. But let's focus on the, it doesn't mean you have to succeed. You can just, even if you can prove just an attempt to destroy a people in whole or in substantial part, you don't have to wipe all of them out. Now that caused us to decide to divide the Sri Lanka landscape into 10 what we called genocidal areas. Uh, in order to prove whether you have attempted to destroy a, a group in substantial part, you have to have a baseline. What is the geographic area you look at to determine whether you destroyed a substantial part in the baseline? Is it Tamils throughout the globe, Tamils in Canada, Tamils throughout the island, or whatever? Now, because the number of genocide prosecutions historically has been very tiny, you could count on them on one hand with fingers left over. There's not a lot of case law in this, so we thought it made sense. If you look at some of the genocide cases that were brought in Bosnia, based upon the Srebrenica massacre, which was a relatively, there's 7,000 or 8,000 were killed in a few days, but the geographic area was relatively small. We decided to divide Sri Lanka into 10 different genocidal geographic zones, if you will. The Northeast, both LTTE controlled and non-LTTE controlled, the East, the South, the West, and then we were able to identify five clusters of villages. We didn't take just a single village where the total population might be as few as 500 or 1,000. But we were able to identify systems of artillery, bombings of schools, of churches, of temples, of displaced persons camps, all these where they were focused and coupled with extrajudicial killings and disappearances that made them sensible geographic areas to focus on, clusters of the villages. They're subunits, if you call it, of the larger regions. And within these 11, what we call genocidal regions, we were able to demonstrate that there clearly was proof of an attempt to destroy the Tamil people in whole or in part. Now, how can you prove intent? Well, in many different ways. We have set forth in the indictment here rather a unique feature that separates the situation in Sri Lanka from all other countries. And that is, uh, in other countries, genocide has been, generally speaking, an aberration from the past. Uh, 